Okay, great. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Janie Hine, and I'm the Natural Resources Director at the Institute for Policy Integrity at NYU School of Law. And I'm joined by my colleague, Max. I'm an attorney at the Institute for Policy Integrity. Um, and we're really pleased to have you all with us today to discuss public lands and option value. Um, Max and I are, are going to you know, provide our presentation, but throughout the whole thing, we want to encourage you to make it um, interactive using the question and answer function or using the chat. Um, we've opened up the chat so that participants can see um, each other's comments. And so we want to encourage that and you know, we'll be monitoring that as, as we go along. Um, so, you know, by way of, of brief background, as many of you know, the Trump administration has offered more acres for lease um, in its first two years than were offered during President Obama's entire second term. By giving away so much of this public land and granting developers a five to 10 year option um, to lease and, and drill for oil and gas, the administration is also depriving the public of other beneficial uses of these public lands, um, including conservation, recreation, renewable energy development, and wildlife protection, and more. In fact, the American West is losing natural lands at a rapid clip. About a football field-sized natural area uh, is lost every two and a half minutes due to development. And about a quarter of the country's greenhouse gas emissions actually derive from production on public lands. So today we're going to discuss how option value or the informational value of delay uh, should be factored into BLM's land use planning processes and its lease sales. And by being far more strategic about resource trade-offs and timing, BLM can significantly improve the way that it manages our public lands. In, in doing this, it can better protect environmental values and regain some of the economic and strategic advantages that it has ceded to private oil and gas developers over the past decade and more. So here's a quick overview of what we'll cover today. Um, I'm just gonna briefly highlight our um, policy integrity's involvement on option value over the years. Then Max is going to uh, give an explanation of what is option value, how can it be applied in the public lands and resources context. Then we'll specifically talk about uh, the use of option value in resource management plans and specifically thinking about framing comments and advocacy to the Department of Interior um, to improve its resource management planning process. And then we'll talk about option value at the lease sale stage. So in, when BLM actually goes to lease public lands for oil and gas development. Uh, and then finally, we'll end with some policy considerations across different administrations. Of course, we're in an election year and things could look very different in a matter of months, depending on that outcome. So we'll touch on that to conclude. Um, and then we do wanna set aside time for, at the end for question and discussion too. So we're aiming for at least 10 minutes, um, but as I mentioned, we're happy to take questions as they come in as we go as well. I should also mention this webinar is being recorded and the slides we will make available to all of the participants uh, who registered. So don't feel like you need to take notes on the, on the slides. Okay, so I just wanna highlight, you know, the Institute for Policy Integrity's past involvement, um, specifically with regard to, to option value and this informational value of delay. So we frequently comment on Department of Interior proceedings. Um, we do comments on fossil fuel lease sales, resource management plans, and Interior's offshore drilling program as well. Um, as part of the background materials for this webinar, we sent an example of some recent comments that we prepared to BLM Utah for a draft environmental assessment uh, on a proposed oil and gas lease sale. Um, so those comments actually, you know, could be a good model if you're interested in learning more and seeing how we actually framed and filed these in a recent proceeding. Um, another uh, example that might be of interest to folks is the, the comments that we prepared on Interior's um, offshore uh, five-year plan for offshore drilling. Uh, 
to the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management. Um, those you can find on our website or I'd be happy to, to send them to anyone that, that wants to track them down. And they provide a bit more detail on the economics of option value, uh, as well as the legal arguments in the context of offshore drilling. So in addition to comments and advocacy, we do reports and academic articles. Um, the second item that we sent as background for this presentation was a report that uh, we published uh, in January of this year called Look Before You Lease, uh, Reducing Fossil Fuel Dominance on Public Lands by Accounting for Option Value. And that report um, has a number of other case studies. Um, you know, Max and I are gonna talk through two case studies here today, um, but those of you curious for more, um, that report is a really good resource. And then finally, uh, the Institute for Policy Integrity, we are a think tank. Um, so we do not bring our own litigation, but um, we have been involved in litigation through filing amicus briefs. And in one instance, we actually served as the counsel for petitioners um, in the case Center for Sustainable Economy v. Jewel, um, which was a DC circuit, the case decided in 2017. And that opinion um, really has the most in-depth discussion and analysis of option value um, that exists in a federal court opinion. Um, and the kind of commenting and litigation that went into that lawsuit, um, you know, had a meaningful impact on the way that the Department of the Interior um, drafts its five-year plans for offshore leasing. Um, and really as a result of that whole process, the department now includes um, a whole section of its five-year plan on option value and how it thinks that through, um, al although it doesn't quite include everything that, that we would like uh, the department to, to include, as Max is going to cover next. So I'll turn it over to Max. Thanks, Danny. So as Danny said, option value uh, is defined as the informational value gained by delaying a decision. Um, or perhaps a little more specifically to the natural resources context, it's the value of waiting to make an irreversible investment until critical new information arrives. That's how uh, Bowen means it. So generally speaking, uh, option value is a function of irreversibility and uncertainty. The more uncertain something is, the more information uh, it stands to be gained by delay. And the more irreversible a decision is, the harder it is to go back. And of course, if, uh, you, know, you have a more of an incentive to delay uh, in that case versus a decision that you can just change um, back and forth. So what are, what are some examples of, of, of option value? I'll start with a short hypothetical example uh, that actually comes from that Michael Livermore article that Janie mentioned, and I'll just simplify it a little bit. So imagine you operate um, a food stand at uh, the parking lot of a baseball game. Um, you, uh, the, you know, the game is uh, today. Um, you do most of your business right before and right after the game when people are coming and leaving. Uh, but you could also do some business, though not nearly as much, kind of in the early morning for people who you know, show up a few hours early and uh, tailgate up or whatnot. Uh, but there's a cost to setting up uh, your stand. And on this day, there's a chance of rain, in which case the game would be postponed. So if you just have a binary decision right now, early in the morning to set up your stand uh, or not, uh, depending on the chance of rain and your revenues and your upfront costs, um, you know, your decision uh, would, would be based on, on those inputs. But there's also a third option, which is to wait and see, because uh, to see what the weather is, uh, because you have a high upfront cost um, and um, you know, you're, you make most of your money later in the day as opposed to earlier in the day. Uh, so, so in that case, the, the correct option is to do neither A nor B, but is to take option C, which is the option of delay and, and make up your mind later. Uh, and in the Livermore article, he actually quantifies those values uh, and the expected value of making the decision at 11 a.m., let's say, versus 9 a.m., we could call that the numerical option value. Uh, option value is, is not purely hypothetical. There are actual markets uh, for option value. Uh, the most kind of well-known is probably stock options, which is the right to buy or sell security at a specified price within a particular uh, set of time. Uh, 
Uh, and the stock options are often a way for a party to hedge against losses if they uh, expect um, an asset to go up or down. Uh, and then we also see it, and there's been some scholarship written about option value in the context of uh, public lands uh, and fossil fuel development. So fossil fuel developers, they consider option value when deciding what lands to invest in. And the reason we know this is because right now, about half of the lands that are leased by the federal government uh, to fossil fuel developers are currently sitting idle without any development. And that number is actually down. Uh, from where it was about 10 years ago, uh, where it was uh, closer to 70%. And economically, that makes no sense unless you are expecting things to potentially change. If you don't think it's economical to lease the land, to drill on the land right now, there's a cost to leasing the land and to maintaining the land. Uh, and this would not be a rational decision unless you thought there was enough uncertainty that perhaps things can change. Uh, and the land could be much more economical in the future. So you're willing to pay that amount of money right now to delay that decision and give yourself a perpetual option. And at the same time, there's option value on the government side to deciding whether or not to lease the land. Uh, so as Janie mentioned in Boehm's five-year plan, they consider the potential of option value, uh, perhaps not as robustly as we would have liked. But in that plan, they recognized uh, that there's considerable uncertainty uh, in, in that context, it's the offshore leasing context. Uh, they defer to the end of the five-year period, uh, certain parcels where uncertainties were particularly high. Uh, and they recognize that they may choose to cancel those lease sales if those uncertainties are not resolved uh, within that period of time. Uh, so in Center for Sustainable Economy, which is the DC Circuit case that Janie mentioned from 2015, uh, the court, I think, very nicely summarized a lot of the uncertainties that go into um, drilling on public lands. Again, there was in the offshore context, but uh, it's largely applicable. And the court said, more is learned with the passage of time. Technology improved. Drilling becomes cheaper, safer, less environmentally damaging. Development of energy efficiencies and renewable energy resources reduces the need to rely on fossil fuels. As safer techniques and more effective technologies continue to be developed, the costs associated with drilling decline. There is therefore a tangible present economic benefit to delaying the decision to drill for fossil fuels to preserve the opportunity to see what new technologies develop and what new information comes to light. Uh, and uh, after that opinion was, was, uh, was reached, uh, as Janie said, uh, Boehm uh, significantly increased uh, its uh, consideration of option value in its subsequent five-year um, plan. Uh, there are some limitations uh, to that case. Uh, one, as we said, the analysis, is, even in Bohm's current uh, plan, is probably not as robust as we would like. And the DC Circuit uh, said a, a qualitative analysis is sufficient, um, even if a qualitative and a quantitative analysis, analysis may be possible. Uh, and I think more um, on point for, for this seminar is that that was about the offshore context. And it relied on uh, Bohm's, which is part of the Department of Interior, uh, just like BLM, it relied on their obligations under the Outer Continental Shelf uh, Land Act, whereas under the, um, uh, for onshore leasing, uh, that act is not applicable, and you're under uh, FLIPMA and the MLA and statutes where um, you have to make somewhat different arguments, although we do think they're comparable. Um, so, Janie, if you could just go to the, the next slide. Uh, so, I'll just talk very quickly about some of the sources of uncertainty in onshore leasing. I think Center for Sustainable Economy uh, summarized most of them pretty well. Um, we could put them in a few buckets. There's economic uncertainty, environmental uncertainty, land use, uh, technological, uh, legal. Um, I'll highlight a few of these quickly. In terms of economic uncertainty, uh, this is a big one. I'll discuss this more later when we talk about um, uh, lease sales. Um, but basically just, you know, there are wide fluctuations in the oil market um, from year to year, month to month, um, even week to week. Um, so that this is certainly a big source of uncertainty. Uh, environmental uncertainty, we, we already know that drilling is very bad, that it exacerbates climate change, local pollution, harms endangered species. Um, but there's, there's uncertainty here and it actually could be a lot worse than we realize. So for instance, um, you know, only in the last uh, several years or so forth, we've recognize that methane leaks are actually much higher than, than we had previously realized. So that's an example of environmental uncertainty. 
uh, and land use uncertainty. Um, you know, often, not always, but often the lands that uh, BLM proposes for leasing uh, are lands that currently don't have uh, all that much, aren't being put to all that much use often. Uh, but that can potentially change. And as Janie said, there are many possible uses that we can imagine uh, for these lands. Uh, and particularly given how long, um, you know, some of uh, the you know, leases are for five or 10 years initially, uh, typically with an option to extend. Uh, RMPs are plans that go for many years. Uh, so particularly over that protracted, protracted amount of time, there's, there's a high amount of land use uncertainty. Uh, but nonetheless, despite all of these uncertainties um, and the fact that the DC Circuit has recognized that Interior has to consider option value in the offshore context, uh, currently BLM uh, in the onshore context does not even consider option value or recognize it or discuss it. Um, so we've identified uh, some legal strategies to try to bring option value into the process. Uh, and Janie will start with discussing some of those legal avenues we identified, uh, beginning with the resource management plan. Okay, great. Thanks, Max. Yeah, so I want to talk through the resource management planning process. Um, as many of you know, uh, I know a lot of you do this work and have commented on RMPs um, in the past. Um, so, you know, the basic contours of this will be familiar to you, but um, the Federal Land Policy and Management Act, or FLIPMA, um, requires that uh, BLM prepare resource management plans to guide its public land use planning process. Um, and FLIPMA sets out a number of requirements that are really relevant, right? So the first and perhaps most basic is that public lands have to be managed for multiple uses. Um, these uses include recreation, range, timber, minerals, watershed, wildlife and fish, and uh, serve natural, scenic, scientific, and historical values. Um, now, FLIPMA also requires that the United States receive fair market value for the use of public lands and their resources. And it also has a provision stating that Interior shall take any action necessary to prevent undue or unnecessary degradation of these lands. So in order to advance the principles of multiple use and fair market value, FLIPMA directs that BLM develop and revise land use plans, commonly known as these resource management plans. And it establishes nine broad criteria that Interior must consider during this planning process. And I want to highlight on this slide some of the specific language that FLIPMA contains with respect to you know, how it should go about the RMP planning process. So it directs Interior to use the multiple use framework to give priority to the designation and protection of areas of critical environmental concern, to consider present and potential uses of public lands to consider the relative scarcity of the, the values involved, weigh the long-term benefits to the public against the short-term benefits, and a number of other, of other provisions. So, the key takeaway here is that BLM is actually directed to manage public lands for a variety of uses. It does not state that oil and gas or coal development receives priority in any way. And in fact, a number of federal courts have recognized um, this principle. Uh, the Tenth Circuit in 2009, in uh, a very great decision, said it's past doubt that the principle of multiple use does not require BLM to prioritize development over other uses. Um, and as we'll, we'll see in the case study I bring up, this hasn't necessarily been reflected in the RMPs that BLM has produced to date. Um, so a key argument that advocates can make at the RMP stage is that, you know, simply put, BLM should not be tying up all or most of its land in an RMP for extractive uses. And in fact, it must designate some land for other prior priority uses, including conservation, recreation, renewable energy, wildlife protection, and, and others. Now, in the context of option value, if you go back to what Max said about option value being characterized by uncertainty and irreversibility of a decision, this makes the option value argument particularly good where in an RMP, there are multiple, multiple use conflicts, endangered species related conflicts are present, 
Um, there are some known or uncertain environmental risks and sensitivities. And there may be little land left for non-extractive uses. If you remember going back here, one of the things that Interior must think about is the relative scarcity of the values involved, right? So if within an RMP, almost all of it is designated as open to leasing, it doesn't leave much room for other uses. Um, and finally, this may also be a good argument where lands have low fossil fuel development potential, but still have those multiple use conflicts. So I wanted to draw your attention to just one case study. Um, this was a, um, the Carlsbad, New Mexico Resource Management Plan. Um, in 2018, BLM proposed a revision to this RMP. Now, its proposed revision and its preferred alternative would open an additional 86,000 acres for oil and gas extraction um, within this field office. Now, BLM's preferred alternative would make 98% of the area open to oil and gas leasing. Yet, there are several uncertainties associated with drilling in the area, including potential groundwater contamination. The area has a history of sinkhole formation due to oil and gas activities. And the environmental uh, impact analysis raised some questions about whether drilling could have impacts on nearby national parks, including Carlsbad Caverns. So this image here actually shows a map um, of, the, um, of the region at, at que in question, where you can see in green the location of Carlsbad Caverns. And in the, the small black dots are actually active oil and gas wells. Um, so you can see that much of this uh, region is already um, designated for oil and gas leasing, if not under active um, oil and gas development already. Um, and there are also some areas of critical environmental concern highlighted in yellow uh, near where BLM is proposing actually allowing additional uh, leasing activity. So what are the relevant option value considerations? Well, multiple use conflicts we think are high here. Um, and again, this goes, to kind of, this goes to the scarcity, this goes to wildlife impacts, um, tying up the lands really almost exclusively for oil and gas and not allowing these other multiple uses. Risks and environmental uncertainty are also high, um, specifically for this region with um, concerns about groundwater contamination. Um, the state of New Mexico, actually 90% of the state of New Mexico relies on groundwater as their main drinking water source. Um, and there are some uh, questions about drilling above fragile geology in the region, karst limestone, um, and how any contamination issues could spread more rapidly because of that geology. And then production potential, we might think about when we're thinking through an option value analysis, like again, what are the trade-offs here? Here, the region actually has medium to high production potential, but on net, when we look at all of the factors together, we would say that the option value is high and strongly counsels towards designating less acreage within the RMP for leasing. It also weighs towards more protective criteria and stipulations for any acreage that may still be included within that RMP. Um, so things like no surface occupancy, um, taking specific parcels that are close uh, to the Carlsbad National Park um, off the table for leasing, uh, et cetera. So as the Carlsbad example illustrates, you know, that really counsels towards no additional oil and gas leasing within that RMP at all. Um, and in fact, that BLM should at least consider that as an alternative when it's undergoing its planning and review process. Um, it, the, a no leasing alternative was in fact not one of the alternatives that BLM listed um, for consideration in that RMP process. And so that brings me to kind of the, the next important um, legal hook here is using the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA um, in order to advocate for um, land use designations that are more protective um, and would be much more limited for fossil fuel leasing. Um, so as many of you know, NEPA um, requires an environmental impact statement for any federal action that would significantly affect the quality of the environment. RMPs require EISs to um, be prepared while RMPs are being revised. 
But uh, a key requirement of NEPA is that the agency consider uh, a reasonable range of alternatives. Now in this RMP process though, BLM sometimes only an analyzes a limited number of alternatives, including its preferred alternative and the no action alternative. Now in the RMP context, often the no action alternative is actually just relying on an older RMP um, instead of being a no leasing option, right? Um, so this is a good chance for advocates to, you know, tell BLM that they must consider this no, no leasing option or far more limited leasing option because of option value and because of these risks. Um, and in fact, case law would be on our side here. Um, the 10th Circuit opinion I mentioned earlier actually found that BLM violated NEPA when it failed to consider an alternative of not opening specific lands to leasing in a land use plan that are extraordinary, extraordinary in their fragility and importance as habitat. Um, and a federal district court in Colorado reached a similar conclusion about another RMP process. Um, NEPA also requires EISs and shorter environmental assessments to take a hard look at adverse environmental effects. So many of you are already familiar with this requirement, but here it kind of goes hand in hand with if there are risks and uncertainties that you think you know, really increase the option value, well, often those are going to be environmental effects that the agency may not have taken a sufficiently hard look at. Um, and then finally, BLM in EISs and uh, in EAs as well for lease sales, often touts the economic benefits of oil and gas development within an RMP or for a lease sale. Um, but it, it often fails to fully analyze or disclose the adverse economic impacts um, to a field office or to a region from these alternatives. And so this is a chance if you have the data um, or can find the data on the revenue and job um, benefits of recreation, of conservation, you can put those into the record and urge BLM you know, to take a more balanced look at the economic effects um, of the preferred option and the alternatives. So, you know, as a whole, the RMP land use planning process really provides the first opportunity for BLM to weigh whether public land should be offered for energy development leasing, and if so, on what scale. And an appraisal of option value at this stage would help BLM account for the uncertainty and irreversibility that characterizes leasing for, for energy development. Great. So as far as the lease sale stage, uh, so as many of you know, uh, lease sales are conducted um, at the BLM state office level uh, and the states uh, that are more active in leasing, um, Montana, New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, uh, they typically have uh, a lease sale every quarter uh, in March, June, uh, September and December. Um, and although the lease sale doesn't go through the same um, full NEPA process um, that an RMP does of uh, releasing an EIS. Uh, they still uh, do a truncated NEPA process through an environmental assessment. Uh, there is a comment period on that. Uh, it's a shorter document, but it's still several dozen pages long and gives plenty of fodder, I think, for advocates to make um, good arguments. Uh, and then there's a protest stage as well uh, when BLM uh, finalizes the lease sale. Uh, there's an opportunity to protest between when they put a parcel in that final stage and when the lease sale is actually um, held. Uh, so what are the types of arguments that advocates uh, can make here? Uh, so I think some of the arguments that Janie mentioned in the RMP context are just as relevant in the lease sale context. I won't go into those in detail, uh, but when there are potential land use conflicts uh, for uh, the, the proposed parcels, uh, multiple use arguments are particularly strong there. Uh, and I'll say, I think those arguments are perhaps even stronger uh, in cases where the parcels have, have low development potential. Uh, because in that case, it's likely, as I said, the majority of um, lands that are leased are just sat on by developers for, for years and years, often with never any development. Uh, of course, from an environmental perspective, that's probably preferable to uh, actually having drilling. Uh, but from a land use perspective, I think it makes the argument even stronger you know, the oil and gas developer is literally doing nothing with the land 
um, and yet they're depriving the public of all these uh, potential uses. Uh, in terms of failure to consider alternatives, as Janie mentioned, uh, lease sale EAs uh, typically or almost always have only two options, the no action option and the preferred option. Uh, in this case, the no action uh, option is actually a genuine um, no leasing um, alternative. Uh, so, so perhaps it's a little better than the RMP stage. Uh, and that may actually be the preferred option uh, for, for most of us in most lease sales. Um, but you know, the RMP case law that Jenny suggested uh, says that that may be inadequate. Um, you know, that, you know, surely there's, uh, uh, you know, some kind of prioritization that uh, BLM may, may want to do and the option of deferring, uh, you know, the vast majority of the parcels, uh, you know, perhaps is an option uh, that they should consider uh, as well. Uh, one argument uh, that is certainly relevant in the RMP stage, and Janie mentioned it, but we think is particularly strong at yeah, the lease sale stage is this argument about fair, mar fair market value. Um, because fair market value arguments are typically uh, pretty sensitive to the current market conditions. Uh, whereas at the RMP stage, often you're talking about leasing that will occur um, years and years in the future. At lease sale, you're commenting on uh, a parcel that will be sold imminently. Um, and in times of considerable economic uncertainty, uh, like today, for instance, uh, there's there's a high option value uh, from the economic perspective, given the economic uncertainty. Uh, and particularly when there are poor economic conditions, uh, particularly given the background of oil speculation and the fact that um, you know, oil and gas developers are often sitting on lands to begin with, the, the fact that the oil uh, and gas um, development is unlikely to occur, in the near term at least, makes all the other arguments for option value so much stronger because if the government, if there's unlikely to be drilling in the near term, again, while this is better from an environmental perspective to the alternative, it, it means there's, there's even less reason not to delay. Because from the government's perspective, if there's not gonna be any drilling in the near term, then that means the government's gonna get virtually no revenue in the near term. And there's pretty much no reason for the government to make the decision today to lease the land so the oil and gas developer can sit on it versus waiting uh, several years or, or, or however much longer uh, to make the decision uh, when, uh, when the land can be put to productive use and more can be learned uh, during that time. So how little does the government actually make when uh, a land is leased but not developed? Uh, very little, uh, it turns out. So um, the vast majority of the revenues from oil and gas uh, leasing program come from uh, royalties, which only occurs when they're drilling. So typically the royalty rate is 12.5%. We should note that that's actually lower than it is in most states. Um, and it is really just a very low uh, royalty rate objectively, but uh, it, it does bring in a fair, a fair amount of revenue and that revenue is typically split between the federal government uh, and the state governments. Uh, so if there's no drilling on the parcel, uh, what does the federal government get? Well, they get a $435 application fee to, uh, to lease the land. Uh, and then they put the parcels in an auction uh, where uh, a qualified bidder, which is only an oil and gas developer, uh, has to bid a minimum of $2 per acre uh, to get the land. Uh, that's very frequently what low potential lands go for. Uh, sometimes they go for a few dollars above the minimum, maybe five, ten dollars per acre. Uh, we're really talking about peanuts here. Uh, and then there's even a loophole to that process, which is when a parcel um, is put in the lease sale but gets no bids, uh, it then becomes available for non-competitive leasing, at which point an oil and gas developer can get the land uh, for just the $435 application fee uh, and the land is theirs. And all you have to pay if you're not drilling is a um, leasing fee of $1.50 of $1 per acre. Uh, so we're literally talking about a few thousand dollars uh, to the federal treasury uh, for large parts of the land that sit um, undrilled. Uh, and these arguments are, are, have arguably never been stronger than now. Uh, so Janie, if you go to the, the next slide, you know, given the, uh, the current state of the economy uh, and the fact that the oil market is really depressed worldwide, uh, the government right now is making very, very little revenue uh, from, from new leasing uh, due to two phenomena. Uh, one, there's low bids and minimal competition 
and two, there's low extraction uh, in royalties. Uh, so starting with low bids, you know, so right now global demand for oil has dropped precipitously in the last few months. Uh, the current price of oil is about $39 a barrel. That's down from about $61 uh, in January, a drop of over 35%. And forecasters, forecasters believe that that is not a temporary drop. That at this point, this is probably a permanent drop. Uh, BP has cut its estimates for its oil and gas uh, prices for the coming decades by between 20 and 30%. Uh, the International Monetary Fund has projected a similar um, decline. Uh, so at this point, they're expecting rates maybe to bounce back a little bit further, uh, but really not very much. Um, and what we've seen ever since the pandemic hit and oil prices have dropped is that lease sales have had very, very poor results. Um, bonus bids this year are down 83% compared to last year. Uh, there were lease sales held at the, end of, at the end of March when the market was uh, close to at its lowest and most volatile. Uh, those did, did horrendously. Uh, for instance, a lease sale in Utah, uh, there were 18 parcels that went for the minimum bid of $2 per acre and only four parcels that went above that minimum bid. Uh, in Colorado, less than half of the uh, leases even sold uh, for a bid. Um, BLM temporarily postponed lease sales in June, um, but then they, they held their lease sales in September, uh, many of which in the past week, uh, typically folding in the parcels that were supposed to be uh, sold in June. Uh, those sales have done a little bit better than the sales in March, uh, but, but not that much. And then we're seeing very low extraction in royalties. Uh, so right now, the number of active wells is down nearly 70% uh, from where it was a year ago in the United States. Uh, as we said, this is great news uh, for the environment, but it gives even more reason for BLM to slow down its leasing program and to consider delay because they're getting so little in the short term from this program. You know, the argument for leasing before was, hey, at least we're getting these federal and state revenues that can go to good uses. And that argument is, is really not um, holding much water right now. And compounding the fact uh, that there's low drilling right now is that this administration, ostensibly in the name of COVID-19, uh, has also been encouraging royalty rate reductions, uh, some very steep ones. So as I mentioned, the normal royalty rate is 12.5%, which is already quite low. Uh, but in the past six months, uh, over 500 leases uh, have seen the royalty rates reduced after BLM issued guidance effectively uh, encouraging um, oil and gas developers to apply for a reduction and streamline the process. And some royalty rates have gone down to as low as 0.5%, um, which is a drop of, of over 95% from the normal royalty rate. Uh, so even on some lands that are still being drilled, and again, those are down substantially, uh, the government is making a lot less revenues, even on those lands. So there's just very little reason even if you are pro drilling and think that the, the revenue is, is good, there's, there's really just no reason to be leasing these lands or very little reason to be leasing these lands at this time. And given all the uncertainties involved, the, the, uh, the option value arguments are just so much stronger. And I will just note very quickly that it's important to keep in mind that this is occurring against a backdrop of what was already an oversaturated market. Uh, for uh, public lands because of, as Janie mentioned, the Trump administration uh, really went on a leasing frenzy, particularly in the early years, uh, but continuing to this day. Uh, I will say this is one of the most incredible stats I've ever seen. In 2017, uh, which was the, the high water mark for uh, this administration's um, making public lands available for lease, only 7% of those lands even received a competitive bid. Uh, meaning that more than 10 million acres of land were available to snatch up without any upfront bid. Uh, and some oil and gas developers have caught on to this and are basically making it a strategy to nominate parcels for lease. It's discretionary whether BLM actually puts them up for lease or not, but under this administration, they normally have been, uh, and then not bid on them and then snatch them up. Uh, so as I said, this combination of high speculation combined with poor market conditions and low revenues makes the case for option value particularly strong at this moment uh, and at any time uh, where the market is, is particularly bad. I'll go through one case study very, very quickly. Uh, this was a, a lease sale, uh, lease sale is actually happening uh, today, but in the original proposal for the lease sale, this was for Utah's September 2020 oil and gas lease sale. 
In the original proposal, there were, I think, 49 parcels representing over 87,000 acres that were near Canyon Land and Arches National Park. Um, you know, that's very high uh, conflict potential lands. You know, these are next to these pristine national parks. There's a lot of recreation and tourism in the area. And even if these particular parcels weren't in the areas that were um, being used the most for those purposes, uh, you know, certainly over, over years, uh, they had high potential for those other uses. Expected production was, was low or, or maybe moderate uh, under BLM's own projections. Uh, so again, if you go into the, the, the NEPA assessment, uh, BLM will offer its own, what they call reasonable foreseeable development forecast, uh, where they actually project you know, what is the production of the wells, uh, of the parcels, and how many you know, wells um, will be built and so forth. Uh, and in this case, they acknowledge that some of the parcels had low or I think very low in, in, in a couple cases uh, potential. And then as I said, current marking conditions are poor. Uh, it's, it's, uh, probably putting it mildly. Uh, so, so given all three of those factors here, the option value was uh, e extremely high. And, and I think the case here was especially strong. Uh, there was very fierce opposition from, from, from many uh, groups, both local and national. Uh, I'm sure some of uh, you were probably involved in those efforts and, and they were ultimately successful on these parcels were pulled. Um, you know, I will say, you know, this was kind of a, a special case where, where, you know, BLM's, uh, you know, it was just so flagrant in trying to lease parcels that had such obvious value in such terrible economic times. Uh, but while the arguments for option value may not be quite as obvious uh, when there are fewer land use conflicts or higher production potential, uh, we think they remain uh, viable or, or actually quite strong so long as the marketing conditions remain weak or oil con companies continue to engage in the practice of leasing lands and sitting on them for years and years. Uh, so, Jane, if you want to discuss some of the um, issues across administrations. Yeah, great. Thanks, Max. Um, and, and just to kind of close the, the thread on, on Max's part, so what we, what we try to do in our comments at the lease sale phase is, you know, specifically make the argument that in light of um, these depressed market conditions, the lack of competition, the royalty rate deductions, et cetera, you know, BLM is failing to earn fair market value for the use of its public lands and resources. And so it's actually violating FLTMA by continuing to lease in this environment. Um, so, uh, you know, to the extent that's an argument that, uh, that you haven't made or, or would like to think more about, you can find how we kind of frame that in more detail in these comments. So I wanna just briefly touch on uh, you know, how the option value argument might be considered across different uh, potential presidential administrations, right? Um, so, you know, hopefully we'll know the outcome um, of the election in, uh, in a matter of months. And the, the Department of the Interior may look very different uh, depending on that outcome. Um, so, you know, first let's consider a potential Biden-Harris uh, administration. So the Biden campaign has made several public pronouncements that they would like to see uh, an end to new uh, fossil fuel leasing on public lands. Um, it's generally phrased uh, in a kind of broad way um, without you know, specific details. But if that is in fact the case, um, you know, we may very well see uh, at least a short term end to new fossil fuel lease sales. Um, and so that of course would be an abrupt shift and you know, a lot of the discussion we just had about comments at the lease sale stage would kind of fall away. Um, the other thing that the campaign has said is that, you know, they want, <clears throat> of course, to kind of get back on track to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And one key way that that can happen is, you know, creating a greenhouse gas emission reduction target for public lands, for the resources that are produced from public lands and, and consequently transported and, and burned downstream. So we might see a new climate action plan that sets a greenhouse gas emission reduction target specifically for public lands. Um, in line with that, I think there may be potential for a lot of revisions to resource management plans. Um, and this would provide a, a pretty important opportunity um, for, the, for the public to participate, um, to make arguments for you know, considering the alternatives that value conservation, that value and measure carbon sink potential 
um, and that make more room for renewable energy development. Uh, the Biden administration has also publicly said that they want to accelerate renewable energy development, um, including wind energy. And so I think we can expect a lot more um, attention to that side of things. And then finally, I think there's an opportunity to think about using resource management plans to meet those greenhouse gas emission goals. Um, like how will they be restructured and revised to meet that declining cap on emissions? Um, there's also been some discussion um, of you know, whether there should be a net zero greenhouse gas emissions goal in the immediate term. Um, and so thinking through some, some different um, scenarios like using offsets uh, in the form of carbon sink um, or, or carbon sequestration and increased renewable energy development within an RMP in order to meet a net zero greenhouse gas emission goal. So this is all just this, just, uh, you know, conjecture of what this could look like. But the other thing I think um, is that ideally we would have a BLM that's more receptive to environmental sensitivities and risks. Um, and that could take the form of potential new regulations, um, you know, governing land use planning, governing, you know, how BLM thinks about and mitigates risks, including climate risks. And there's also a potential for BLM to reconsider some of the specific um, NEPA analyses that it prepared under the Trump administration um, or, or decisions. And in one example that just came to mind is, you know, drilling within the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and, um, you know, potentially reopening the NEPA process due to deficiencies in the NEPA analysis itself um, that, uh, that really require further, further analysis. So the flip side of this, you know, if we, um, if we have a, four more years of a Trump administration, um, you know, this administration has really not been receptive to any of the fair market value style arguments um, that Max really highlighted, you know, about lack of a fair return to the public. So I don't expect that to change. Um, the best strategy seems to be to continue strong comments um, on all resource management plans, lease sales, of course, regulatory rollbacks that go to things like methane and hydraulic fracturing. And then I think it really will be time to consider new litigation strategies. Um, and that's you know, part of the purpose for this webinar uh, today to, to make sure people are thinking about this. What could that look like? Could we use different provisions of FLIPMA um, or NEPA uh, to really make these arguments stronger and, and bring more lawsuits against um, you know, RMPs and lease sales that, that we, we find do not meet the legal standards. Um, so I'm not gonna spend any time going over this slide, but I have this here really for those of you who may be newer to this kind of commenting process for, for public lands. Um, but most of you that are on the webinar, um, I recognize a bunch of names and so I'm not going to over this in detail, but it's here um, for those of you that are curious just about, you know, general tips that we would, Max and I would suggest for your comments. So I really want to open it up at this point to questions. Um, you know, any clarification questions, any big picture things that we didn't get to, um, I would love to, to hear from, hear from you. You can just type questions in the chat bar. So while we're waiting for, uh, for anyone to, to enter a question, I wanted to mention something that um, I've just failed to touch on when I was discussing, you know, really the problem with designating too much land in an RMP for oil and gas, even if it's low potential and even if it's not developed. So in past RMPs, you know, BLM has done this and designated these lands as open to leasing. And sometimes those lands are, are snatched up as Max described but unfortunately, even the presence of an oil and gas lease, even if it's not even under development, has foreclosed BLM from designating that same acreage and, and parcel for other important uses like uh, wilderness designation, designation as potential wilderness even, 
um, and of course as uh, as potential areas of critical for critical environmental concern. Um, so that just goes to show even if the lands are low potential and they may not actually see drilling, this does have an adverse effect on designating the land for, for other uses. Okay. I think we just got a question. Okay, great. So Alex, um, anything else you'd want to say about your success in getting option value considered and offshore leasing that we could apply to onshore? Um, you know, I really think the in the offshore leasing example, so we were uh, policy integrity, this predates e even my time, was at this for a number of years, submitting really detailed comments about how the statute, the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, really required consideration of option value and delay, we made actually very parallel arguments about how, um, you know, under OSLA, there, there was a, there's a similar fair market value requirement. There's also an, a requirement to account for you know, economic factors in the planning process. And so we tied, you know, the, the failure of the agency to do that back to the specific statutory mandates under FLIPMA. Um, and that was the argument that the DC Circuit at oral argument engaged with most, um, more than the NEPA arguments. Um, in the offshore context, it's sort of been difficult historically for petitioners to get a foothold with, with NEPA, um, climate related arguments at least. Um, but they, they, they did seem interested in this argument and the court opinion did write about it, you know, kind of at length. Um, I think what led to the meaningful change in the written policy was, you know, just the, the detailed nature of the comments and then frankly, the, the threat of the litigation. Um, the timing was such that the Department of Interior released uh, a new draft five-year plan about a month or two before the DC Circuit opinion was published and came out. So they wanted to finalize that plan before they knew which way the, the, the court was going to rule. Um, and, and so I think it is an example of, you know, effective commenting and advocacy which led to kind of novel litigation and legal strategies, um, which, you know, together kind of convinced the agency that this was worth doing. Any other questions? Yeah, so Ben asks, um, do you have an example you could post of quantification of option value, either in a real world example or a hypothetical one? Um, so in terms of real world examples, you know, the obvious one that comes to mind is like the stop options context, right, where um, there actually is like a price one would pay for this option to delay. Um, and there's an economic upside to waiting and, and seeing, you know, what happens with a stock price, for instance. So that's a really clear cut, you know, simple one. Um, in the natural resources context, it is a bit more complicated. There is economic literature um, that uh, kind of provides a lot of formulas and calculations for how one would do this. Now, the problem that we've had is that it would require BLM or BOEM in the offshore context to kind of take on that modeling in a more in-depth way, um, perhaps in concert with uh, uh, you know, economic consulting uh, group, either within the administration or without. Um, but it's something that, you know, we're still thinking about, we're monitoring the literature on, and, um, you know, ideally the agency would create some sort of working group and come up with a way to, to quantify it. Um, I should say a, a kind of mini example of quantification is that BOEM and Offshore uses something called a hurdle price where they actually do come up with a quantitative estimate of how high a resource price would need to be to make it uh, sort of in the public's interest or in the government's interest to lease a resource. Um, so, so that's kind of a, a narrow way of getting at it. We would actually want that to be much more broad and consider a number of environmental costs and benefits of leasing, which they do not do, but they do kind of this hurdle price analysis, which just goes to the economic question, economic part of, 
of quantification. Yeah, another the um, the lemonade stand example that I gave. If you actually go to the, um, you know, it's a very kind of simple example. Um, but if the start of the the Mike Livermore article actually does that in quantitative form, and it looks at the expected value of the decision if you make it, you know, early in the day versus later in the day. Um, yeah, I mean, for the natural resources context, it's a lot more challenging, obviously, because the the inputs are are harder. And you know, as Janie mentioned, right now, BLM. Uh, really does very little cost benefit analysis um, at all. You know, they don't uh, monetize climate harm, even though those are actually very easy to monetize. Um, so to do that expected value calculation, I think would be way more than BLM is doing right now or that courts have really been willing to ask them to do. Um, Jane, do you have any insights? There was a follow-up question on um, Example from the oil and gas industry, considering? Yeah, I mean, the great question. I think the easiest answer to that is that that would directly feed into how much they're willing to bid in any of these proceedings, any of these lease sales, right? So they're going to come up with an internal estimate of how much leasing these lands is worth to them. And that's going to include the option value, uh, probably going out to the term of the lease, the lease, right? The five to 10 year initial lease term. They're going to think about, well, if things change, you know, how much would I be willing to pay? Um, to, to have the lease while I'm waiting to see what happens. Um, you know, so the minimum bid can kind of give you a sense of how they're thinking about that. Um, and as Max mentioned, the higher bids for lands that have higher potential um, and the lower bids for lands that have lower potential are, are right in line with how we would think about option value and how that would be quantified from a private developer's perspective. Yeah, I mean, at a very basic level, the amount of, um, the sunk costs that the developer is willing to put into the land, I think is a low bound estimate of option value. So the amount that they're, they're bidding for the land plus, you know, any uh, maintenance and surveying and so forth. Um, that, yeah, we didn't even get into it here because, oh, that's right. Um, we didn't get into it here because, um, if we have a new administration, that things might change so dramatically that lease, lease sales would be sharply curtailed, curtailed or, or paused. But um, you know, another way to think about it would be interior should at least increase minimum bids to account for option value, increase rental rates, increase royalty rates, you know, all of those fiscal terms. Um, but, uh, but that might be a, a secondary option to just cur curtailing the, the program altogether. Um, someone asked if the, the presentation will be shareable, so we will uh, email it to all of the registered participants. Okay, um, well, our contact information was on our final slide. Um, or you can find our contact information also at our at our website. And uh, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. And uh, yeah, take care. Thank you. Thanks.